Hi, welcome back. This is my fourth data update for 2022. And in this session, I'd like to drill down on individual companies. In other words, get from the big picture what risk premiums look like for markets and how inflation might affect them to the hurdle rates for individual companies. So let's get the show on the road. To get an assessment of hurdle rates for individual companies, we have to start talking about risk in a serious way. And in the first few weeks of 2022, we've got a reminder in case we needed it, that risk never goes away. In good markets, we often tend to forget about risk. Investors all talk about risk, but it's an abstraction until you really feel it. And sometimes you need the ups and downs of markets to remind you that risk is always there. Always there. So in this session, what I'd like to do is start with a working definition of risk that I think we can all agree upon. And then talk about measuring risk, where I'm sure there'll be plenty of disagreement about how exactly to measure the risk in an investment or a company. So I'm going to start with my working definition of risk. I don't know Chinese, so this could be a hoax pulled on me, but I've been told that the Chinese symbol for crisis or big risk is a combination of two symbols, danger plus opportunity. To me, there is no better way of thinking about risk than think about it as a combination of danger and opportunity. That definition has stood me in good stead any time I've been confused about risk and thinking about risk or talking about risk. In fact, take a look at that definition because embedded in it are a few lessons that we can all take away about risk. Here's the first one. When you're given an opportunity and told there is no danger in the opportunity, beware. It's a delusion. In fact, almost every great scam in history, the Ponzi scheme, the South Sea bubble, the Madoff scheme, were built on that delusion. You can get high returns without taking risk. Conversely, if you find yourself in, exposed to danger without any opportunity, that's not a good, that's, that's foolhardy. In finance, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're not a bungee jumper taking on risk for the sake of risk. That's what separates investing from gambling. Third, it's uncertainty about outcomes, not the level of the outcome itself that creates risk. That sounds a little confusing, but people often get confused between bad outcomes and uncertainty about bad outcomes. I'll, I'll give you two examples to illustrate my point. In my last session, I talked about inflation and how it affects investors. And I said it's not high inflation that affects investments, it's uncertainty about inflation. If you were told that inflation was going to be 10%, you were guaranteed it's going to be 10% a year forever, you'd learn to live with it. We'd adjust to it. It would not be a risk. It's a fact that inflation can go from 4 to 14 back to 4 that creates risk. Here's another example. I'm often told that companies with bad management are riskier than companies with good management. That's not true. If you have a company with bad management, where that bad management is locked into place, it's going to stay bad, you're going to build it into your cash flows and your value. If you have good management where the management is volatile, it's good, it's great, and then it goes back to being average, that's risk. That's uncertainty about the management that creates risk, not the level of the management. Fourth, and this should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, risk is always in the future. There is no risk in the past. No, that, and that's because the past has already happened. The path has already been taken. Unfortunately, though, almost every data item we use to measure risk comes from the past. And we need to be aware of that. We're using past data to forecast the future, but it's a for future that we care about. And finally, we do make a big deal about upside risk and downside risk for good reason. No investor in his right mind ever complains about upside risk. Nobody says my stock went up too much. It's downside risk that concerns us. And there are some people who get caught up in measures of risk that bring in the, the upside as well. They're saying, why are we measuring risk by looking at the upside as well? Why don't we look at just the downside portion? I don't have a problem with that. In fact, there are measures of risk that focus only on downside. But again, going back to the definition of danger plus opportunity, you very seldom get upside without downside. So sometimes it's good to twin the two. So keep those implications in mind because now we're going to start to get practical. As somebody who works in finance, I'm everlastingly grateful for the discipline for what it's done to measure risk. In fact, until finance came along, people were casual about how they measured risk in investing. So in the last 70 years, finance has contributed to measuring risk in a much more systematic way. 
that said though, finance has brought in a couple of things into this process that I think are unhealthy. The first is the tunnel vision from coming up with statistical ways of thinking about risk. You know what I'm talking about? Risk is measured by variance or volatility. It's nice to have a statistical measure, but it can't be the be all and end all of risk. I've told people, you really have not, you know, have not experienced risk until you felt that feeling in the pit of your stomach as you watch the only stock you own drop 30% and you're not able to get through to sell the stock. That's when you realize what risk is. The second problem I think finance has, has brought into this process is it's created this dangerous notion that if you measure something, somehow you're in control. I think it's human nature. The fact that you measure something, you're in control, that's not true, right? All those banks that measured risk with value at risk of ours pre-2008 still stumbled and failed because they had no handle on risk. So just because you measure risk doesn't mean you've got it under control. But if you're willing to take that into, into the process, I think we can start thinking about risk because risk in a company when you make an investment comes in many forms. In fact, I find it useful when I look at a company and I look at all the risks I'm exposed to break those risks down into three sets of buckets. Here's the first, the, the first choice. Is your risk estimation risk or economic risk? So what's the difference? Estimation risk is risk that you can reduce or even make go away, but if you collect more data, do more research, you know, be, uh, analyze the data more. So estimation risk you can reduce by doing more work, by, do, by collecting data. Economic risk, there's nothing you can do. It's going to be there whether you build bigger models, you collect data. I have some bad news for you. A big chunk of the risk you face when you do valuation and investing is economic risk. Building bigger models or collecting more data is not going to make it go away. Second, it could be micro risk or macro risk. What's micro risk? It's risk that is specific to the company or the sector it operates in. So it can come from business models and management. Macro risk is how the company is affected by how the economy moves. You're an automobile company, the economy goes into recession, you're going to be hurt by interest rates moving, by inflation changing. You're saying, who cares? When you have micro risk, risks that are specific to a company, if you're an investor who builds up a portfolio, you have multiple companies in your portfolio, those micro risks average out. Sounds magical, but just the law of large numbers. Because individual companies, those micro risks cut in both directions. Macro risks never average out. Those are the risks that you incorporate and bring into your discount rate when you do a discounted cash flow valuation. So micro versus macro. And finally, you can have continuous risk or discrete risk. I'll give you an example of continuous risk. You're a US company with operations in Europe. Every time the euro dollar exchange rate moves, your earnings are changing in dollar terms, your value is changing. But it's continuous, it happens every moment of every day because it's a floating exchange rate. Conversely, if you're a US company invested in a market with fixed exchange rates, well, as long as the exchange rate fixed, you say there's no risk, there's no risk, there's no risk, until one day you wake up to a huge amount, a big risk because there's a devaluation. Discrete risks don't show up very often, but when they do, they can be in catastrophic form. I mean, I guess this is something that people talk about when they talk about black swans and things you can't bear, they're big catastrophic risk. Let me say it up front that I'd much rather deal with continuous risk in finance, as we know, it has done a pretty good job of figuring out what to do with continuous risk, how to hedge it, how to plan for it, how to bring it into valuation. It's not done a very good job of dealing with nationalization risk and distress risk, discrete risks. So not all uncertainty is created equal. And when you sit down to value a company or do an analysis of a company, the kinds of uncertainty and the type of uncertainty you might, you might face can be very different. In fact, I'm going to use a structure you've seen me use before that I'm very fond of to analyze companies, which is the corporate life cycle. And I think it illustrates how uncertainty shifts across the life cycle. When you have really young companies, startups, very young growth companies, you face a lot of uncertainty about the future. As they mature, the uncertainty decreases, and then it starts to pick up again as companies go into decline and distress. When you think about you know, estimation versus economic uncertainty, early in a company's life cycle, almost all, all of the uncertainty is out of your control. It's economic. Collecting more data, building bigger models is not going to get you any degree of certitude. 
I've seen analysts waste their time and get frustrated with young companies trying to do more research and thinking it's going to lead them to a position of feeling more comfortable with the valuation. Let it go. It's economic uncertainty. As companies age, there's more estimation uncertainty. Maybe there's a bigger payoff to doing data analysis, research, and computing ratios for more mature companies. When you think about micro versus macro uncertainty with young companies, most of the uncertainty you face is micro at the company level or the sector it operates in. So it's about business models and management. So with my, with, when you're valuing young companies, you shouldn't be spending the bulk of your time thinking about interest rates and inflation and GDP. But as with older companies, more mature companies, a bigger portion of the risk is going to come from macroeconomic forces. A mature automobile company might be more dependent on what the economy does than who the management of the company is. And finally, if you think about discrete versus continuous uncertainty, I'm going to focus on one aspect of discrete uncertainty, which is companies sometimes don't make it. With young companies, that risk is high, so there's a great deal of discrete uncertainty because two-thirds of startups don't make it through year two. That decreases as companies mature. It gets close to zero when you get to be a really mature company and then picks up again as you go into decline, especially if you have a lot of debt. So you can see already that your challenge with uncertainty can vary across companies. So at this point, what I'd like to do is take what we've talked about and start talking about hurdle rates because the end game here is investors need a measure of how much they need to make on an investment to decide whether to invest or not. Companies need hurdle rates to decide how to take, whether to take projects, whether to do acquisitions. Let's think about building to a hurdle rate starting with equity. There are two ways you can raise capital. Let's start with equity and the cost of equity. I like to keep things simple, and when I think about the cost of equity, the required return on equity investment, which becomes the cost of equity for a company, and the return that equity investors in that company need to make to invest in the company, there are three ingredients, and each one carries its own load. The first is a risk-free rate, the rate of return you can make on a long-term guaranteed investment. Now, that, you know, we talked, I talked a little bit about this in my last session. But it depends on the currency you pick for your analysis. Your risk-free rate, if you're doing your analysis in US dollars, is going to be very different than in Brazilian reais. A second thing I need to measure is how risky is this company relative to the average risk company? It's a relative risk measure. Now, this is where fights begin in finance because how you come up with this relative risk measure might require you make assumptions about who your investors are and how they measure risk. But let's, no matter what your definition of relative risk is, it comes from two things companies do. One is what business or businesses they choose to be in. And second, how much debt they choose to take on. You're saying, why does debt matter? Because ma it magnifies whatever business risk you're exposed to. So risk-free rate is currency. Your relative risk measure when it comes to the business and the debt load you carry. And finally, there's a price of risk in the equity market, an equity risk premium. And that equity risk premium will come from geographically where you choose to operate. What parts of the world are your operations where you produce your goods and services, where do you sell them? So risk-free rate carries the currency load. Relative risk carries the business load and is affected by the debt you have. And your equity risk premium is determined by the geographies you operate in. I see analysts often double counting or triple counting risk because they try to make each measure carry more than one burden. Let each measure carry one burden. So with that set up, let's talk about measuring relative risk because, as I said, there's a lot of debate about how best to do it. Now, if you look at the oldest risk and return model in finance, the capital asset pricing model, and I know a lot of people don't like it, the relative risk of a company is measured with a beta. That's really what a beta is. It's not some you know, monumentally deep concept. When you say a beta for a stock is 1.2, you're saying it's 1.2 times more risky than the average stock in the market. So you're saying, why, this, why is there so much heat about beta if that's all it does? Because it comes with, with, with a lot of baggage. In, in specifically, whenever you use betas, you are making the assumption that the investors setting prices, the marginal investors in your stock, are diversified. So therefore, the only risk they care about is the risk they cannot diversify away. The rest is going to get averaged out. Betas measure only the risk you cannot diversify away. So when you look at betas, they're designed to do something specific. Measure the risk to a diversified investor, but it's a relative risk measure. Every year I think about this process of estimating betas because I use it in my corporate finance class and valuation. I think part of the problem with betas is how we estimate them. 
the way I was taught to estimate betas and the way most people are taught to estimate betas is to run a regression of your returns on your stock against returns on a market index. Statistically, that's a very dangerous way to think about betas because it's a very noisy estimate. It's one slice of history on one company. So I think one way we can actually come up with better betas is to use the law of large numbers. I'm a great believer that the beta for a company comes from the business it's in, and the best way to estimate the beta is by looking at the betas of other companies in the sector. Every year on my website, I compute the betas by sector for, uh, for 94 different sectors, or really industry groupings in the US, global, Japan. So basically broken down by region in the global beta average. So when I want to value a company, this is where I go to get the beta for my company. Just to give you a sense of what those betas are telling me about the riskiness of sectors, at the start of 2022, to the left you see the least risky business is based on the unlevered beta. The unlevered beta measures the beta in a business cleaned up for the debt you have. Notice um, the preponderance of financial service companies. You might be surprised because you think of financial service companies, you think of them, some of them as risky. But the risk in a financial service company does not come from its underlying business, it's from the leverage that they've put on, the amount of debt they've added on top. In fact, by the time they finish adding the debt, you can see that banks and most financial service companies end up closer to average risk. When you look at the other side of the table, you see the most risky businesses. Technology clearly is a big dominant theme. But you also see a lot of cyclical businesses, da restaurant, dining, you see trucking, because they move up and down with the economy. So betas measure risk you cannot diversify away. And if you are okay with using sector averages, I think you can use them as reasonable measures of relative risk. Now, when you think of how geography pays out in the equity risk premium, in the last session, uh, two sessions ago, I estimated an equity risk premium for the US. I, used, I estimate a forward-looking number, a dynamic number, called it my implied premium, 4.24%. To my, get my equity risk premium for the rest of the world, here's what I do. I start with that 4.24%. I look across the world and I try to measure country risk and I cheat. I use a sovereign local currency rating. This is a rating given by Moody's S&P Fitch for a country where they measure the default risk in a country with a rating. And if your rating is AAA, I give you the same equity risk premium as the US. So Australia, Canada, Germany, Singapore are all going to get equity risk premiums of 4.24%. If your rating is not AAA, I use a lookup table that I update every year of what the default spread would be for your country based on its rating. So as an example, if you take India, India had a BAA3 rating at the start of 2022. And based on what default spreads look like at the start of 2022, a BAA3 rated country should have a default spread of 1.87%. We're almost there. There's one final step I take. The default spread is what I charge for buying a bond issued by that country, but I'm thinking of buying equities. And equities are generally riskier than bonds. How much riskier? I come up with this, um, with this measure of relative risk by dividing the standard deviation of an S&P 500 emerging market equity index by the standard deviation of an emerging market bond index. I come up with 1.16. Roughly speaking, it looks like equities are 1.16 times more risky than government bonds. So here's what I do. I take India's 1.87% default spread. I multiply by 1.16. I come up with 2.18%. You add the 2.18% to the 4.24%, which is the US premium. My equity risk premium for India is 6.42%, and I do this for every one of the 130 countries that have sovereign ratings. There are a few countries, these are called frontier markets, markets like countries like Sudan, North Korea, Syria, that don't have a rating. For those countries, I use a risk score that comes from a service in Europe called political risk services. And I look for countries, so as an example, Syria has a political risk services score of 45.5. The lower the score, the riskier the country. I try to find other countries with scores roughly around 45.5, and I found three. Two of them in ratings and equity risk premiums. I take that equity risk premium and attach it to Syria. Simplistic, you say? Guilty as charged. But by the end of the process, I have equity risk premiums for pretty much every country in the world. It's a heat map, and if you want to actually see the equity risk premiums by country, I would strongly suggest you go to my website, go to data, and you should be able to download the equity risk premium 
for any country or any region in the world. But if you look at this picture, you can see the reddest spots of the world remain in Africa. Africa is the riskiest region in the world, followed by Latin America. Asia used to be much redder. It's turning increasingly green or yellow. It's getting less risky. Europe had a few blotches of red, but they seem to have dissipated. Greece, which had dropped into red territory, seems to have come back to the fold. North America and uh, you know Mexico is, uh, is, is, is little riskier than the US and Canada, but North America, Australia, New Zealand are among the safest regions of the world. And in fact, you might say, why does this matter? Because you might say, look, I look at only US companies. Hey, are you looking at Coca-Cola? It's a US company, but it gets 60% of its revenues outside the US, and perhaps a third of its revenues from some of the riskiest parts of the world. The risk for a company comes from where it operates, not where it's incorporated. And I need this map to value companies because they're global. Now, that's a lot to say about cost of equity. You're saying, well, what about debt? It's true, companies can borrow money. And the cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money long term today. Let me repeat that again. It's the rate at which they can borrow money long term today. It's not the rate at which they borrowed money two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. It makes my life easier to have my definition because here's what I need to do to get a cost of debt. I start with the same risk-free rate that I started my cost of equity with, so the currency matters. I add to that a default spread, and that's going to be driven by you know how much risk there is in a you know how much credit risk there is in a company. You know to add to that, if you're a company in an emerging market, there might be a country risk you've got to carry on your shoulders. Well, it's not fair, but it is what it is. It is true that uh, around the world there is there should be brackets after the risk before the risk free rate and after the default spread because it's overall cost. You get a tax benefit. You get a tax benefit because interest is tax deductible in much of the world. So you net that benefit out. So if you borrow money at six percent, you have a thirty percent tax rate. In effect, you're borrowing money at four point two percent. So the cost of debt is far simpler than the cost of equity. And the cost of capital, the ultimate hurdle rate, is a weighted average of the two. If you think about it, the cost of equity and the cost of debt, two ingredients have different costs. One of the mistakes I think people make is they adopt a very static view of this trade-off, where they say equity is more expensive than debt. So if I replace more expensive equity than cheap, with cheaper debt, my cost of capital should go down. Not so fast. Because when you borrow money, it affects your cost of debt because bankers see more credit risk and you push up the cost of debt. And it also affects your cost of equity because it magnifies the exposure to business risk you have. So when you borrow money, initially they, the cheaper debt might pull down your cost of capital. But as you borrow more and more, there will be a tipping point. Where the tipping point happens will vary across companies. And maybe in a future post, I'll talk about what the optimal debt ratios look like for companies. But the cost of capital is a weighted average of the cost of equity and the cost of debt. So let's see what the cost of capital and cost of equity for companies look like globally. So this is a histogram of cost of capital for companies in US dollars, because I've got to bring them all into the same currency, otherwise I'll have a mess. And um, if you look across U.S. and global companies, numbers, the numbers that should jump out at you are 6.33% and 5.77%. You're saying, what are those numbers? The median cost of capital for a global company is 6.33%. I have 46,000 companies in my sample. 6.33% is the middle of the distribution. The 75th percentile for global companies is 7.25%. By the time you get to 9%, you're already at the 90th percentile. It's even lower for U.S. companies. The median is 5.77%. The 75th percentile is 6.18%. The 90th percentile might be 8%. See what I'm trying to say? The, you know, a big chunk of companies have cost of capital bundled between 55 to 7% now globally. That should lead us to be a little cautious. Now, I've often, when I teach corporate finance, I say the two biggest forces in corporate finance practice are me tooism, where companies try to do what every, their peer group is doing. They borrow money because everybody else is borrowing money. They're paying dividends because everybody else is paying dividends. And the other is inertia, where companies do what they've always done because it used to work for them in the past. And unfortunately, hurdle rates have been affected by these two forces.
Uh, when I talk to companies, sometimes I ask them what their hurdle rate is, and they say it's 15%. And they say, where did you come up with that? Well, we said in the 1980s, we've never quite revisited it. Let me be very clear here. Both investors and companies who demand unrealistically high returns in this market will get shut out of the market. I've seen investors tell me that they would not invest in a stock unless it delivers double-digit returns. Don't get me wrong, I love double-digit returns as well. But in this market, asking for double-digit returns might mean that you can have only 20% of your portfolio invested in stocks. I've seen companies demand 12% hurdle rates. In this market, if you demand those hurdle rates, investments are not going to pass muster. You're going to lose your market share to competitors who adopt more realistic hurdle rates. In short, companies have to decide whether they want to hold on to these hopes of making double-digit returns. They're not expectations. Or whether they want to live in the world we live in of low interest rates and low, low required returns and say, we've got to bring those hurdle rates down to be comparative. So if you're, be, if you, if you're a company and you're using hurdle rates, I'd strongly suggest you look at those hurdle rates. You're saying... I did give you the hurdle rates and only in US dollars, right? But to come up with, convert them to rupee or rei hurdle rates is pretty simple. Take that inflation differential that I talked about during my last session, add it on. So the inflation in India is 2% higher than the US. Add that on to those numbers you saw on the previous page and you should get a sense of what, what, a, what a typical cost of capital should look like for an Indian company in Indian rupees, a Brazilian company in reais. I hope you found this session useful and I you know I, I you know I think a big part of finance is getting perspective and I hope this session has given you at least some sense of perspective what the numbers look like in the market today. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you have a good day.